So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Finance uh, uh, Medical Seminar. Pleasure to welcome Swalit Asir. Uh, he's from NUS, from National University of Singapore, uh, organized uh, such a uh, symposium at the Material Research Conference at the MRS meeting in the West Coast of Mexico. And he's visiting Montreal. And so I'm really happy that you can contact me. Possibly a few months seminar because I think the topic uh, is very interesting. It also works a lot in 2D materials and you know, making them at, at a scale where you can commercialize them. So if you're interested in that, uh, please happy to talk to you about it. Just in terms of a little bit of background, uh, so everybody is a senior research fellow at the National University of Singapore, and he did his, uh, he's been there for close to five years. Yes, right. Uh, and before that, he did his PhD at the Cavendish Lab at the University of Cambridge on things like negative differential resistances, membristors, that behavior, um, you know, more than more, I guess. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so with that, hopefully, take it away. Thanks so much. Right. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a delight being here. Um, so the seminar uh, that will be given today, I will focus on logic and memory functions and the uh, Non-electronic structures, but uh, mostly on uh, molecular functions. So this will be mostly about molecular electronics. So my name is Alexander Big uh from NUX, and most of the uh, results that I will be showing here uh, were during my uh, postdoc time with uh, Chris Lighthouse, who's currently at the University of London. And so with this, um, I'll start the seminar. If this lets me move on to the next slide. Okay, so um, the talk will be as follows. So I will give some introduction and backgrounds with uh, molecular and self assembled electronics. Uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, memory devices because essentially the results that I'm going to talk about combine those two fields. Uh, I will then talk about negative differential resistance and uh, synaptic emulation. Um, and then I will briefly introduce some. Uh, New way of contacting uh, molecular junctions using uh, AFM and the manipulation of uh, liquid metal droplets. Um, so, molecular electronics, I'm sure uh, a lot of you uh, are aware, was uh, first introduced as potentially a way to, uh, as a shortcut to the end of Moore's law, where you could go directly to the smallest physical possible size of electronic components. Um, so, but it became quite interesting as it was uh, ruled by different uh, physical principles as you would have from traditional transistors. Um, so in its simplest form, you could uh, think about a molecular junction as being some kind of uh, semiconductor that will be uh, highly discretized in terms of energy level, uh, squeezed in between two electrodes. So this is the way it's, under it's understood in the Landau model. Uh, and one thing that's interesting is that every parameter on this sort of energy landscape uh, can be tuned, uh, whether it be the sort of the density of states of your electrodes, uh, whether it is the sort of energy structure of your uh, molecular junction, so where those uh, energy orbitals uh, are based, but also the thickness of the walls of the tunneling barriers, uh, the temperature on the on either side. And so by tuning those, you can obtain uh, what I would call functional transports. So things that uh, differ from a simple sort of tunneling pair. Uh, so one famous example that was from, um, so like what former group at NUS, uh, the Access group is by creating the structure, which is highly uh, uh, asymmetric. You actually have your energy levels conducting the transports uh, much closer to one of the electrodes than the other. And what this leads to is uh, extreme rectification of several orders of magnitude. So this was found uh, a couple of years before I joined that group, and I'll show you how we sort of uh, went one step further from that afterwards. This is from um, the famous group in, uh, at Delft, uh, the group of uh, Van der Zandt, uh, where they work on single molecule junction, and they can also, they've also tuned the sort of coupling between the electrodes and those molecules and could shift between uh, a regime where you have strong coupling and so a very sort of smooth tunneling curve to um, weak coupling, where you start to see effects like a uh, Coulomb blockade uh, and that kind of thing. And they were able to tune that within the same junction by spacing the electrodes. Uh, and one thing that uh, I'll mention a bit more um, 
in, in a second, which is uh, one of the projects that I did uh, in my PhD uh, with uh, George Ruman and Chris Holt, uh, which was about uh, using quantum dots, but that behave in a similar way with the sort of homonimo and discretized energy states, where you could get, you could get Coulomb staircases by sort of um, end making individual energy states and zero conduction window. Um, so molecular electronics approaches, uh, I, um, you typically have two schools, a single molecule uh, school where you would probe individual compounds, um, and the self-assembled monolayer um, kind of approach. I, I put sort of um, architectural analogies for those, and I try to make them topical by using monuments of Singapore, but th there aren't many. So uh, there's the uh, Elix Bridge, uh, which is which sort of um, is an allegory of uh, bridging two electrodes with uh, a sort of molecular chain. Uh, and on the other side, the self assembled monolayer, where you have a structure standing up, so your molecules, and then you put an electrode on top, and you hope that you can get conductions through that, uh, through that structure. Uh, so this pros and cons, they typically use for different things. A single molecule typically gives you a, a way to probe the structure a bit more um, on, a, on a more fundamental level. Uh, it's more often uh, it, it's it's more often used in a sort of a STM approach as fabrication of these junctions because it's extremely challenging. Uh, so you don't really have commercial or commercial adjacent devices that much in a single uh, molecule approach. Well, self assembled monolayer is, is, is essentially a thin film device uh, where you have you coat uh, a bottom electrode with your nanometer uh, size film. And then you do some processing and you deposit the top electrode and you have possibly a complex signal or possibly an average of all of the molecular structures that are contacted that way. Uh, and there's lots of questions about interfaces, etc. But um, there are ways uh, things have improved in that field in the past few years. So there's a few approaches that have been developed for contacting those uh, self-assembled monolites. Uh, so in the initial stages of the field, people uh, try to directly evaporate a metal onto those films, and that led to short circuit most of the time, at 99, probably 0.9% of the time. There, have some, there are some papers where they said that the yield is um, less than 1%, and I, 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 I feel sorry for the PhD students who had to measure uh, 100 uh, failing devices until they found a uh, positive result. Um, but since then, uh, and especially since the, let's say, uh, probably, um, what year would it have been? I'd say around 2005, 2008, but that, that kind of a uh, regime. So you started to have new uh, approaches. Um, more recently than this, I think in 2014, you had the, um, the Korean group by Taki Lee that uh, suggested using graphene. Uh, as a contact, uh, or the wet transfer of the material. So <laughs> deposited fish, uh, essentially your molecules, uh, fish are top electrode with your molecules in a wet transfer kind of way. That was a very gentle process that allowed for very high yields. So for those, they could approach 99% that kind of yields. And then what I'm going to talk about the most is uh, eutectic aluminium, which is a liquid metal. So that was developed in a Harvard in the work, <laughs> work sites group. Uh, with the involvement of um, Ryan Kiffey and uh, Chris Neuhaus, who was the supervisor of my previous postdoc, um, with whom I, I, did, I conducted this project. Uh, the nice thing about this liquid metal is that it gives you uh, two approaches. You can either use it as a conductive tip setup. So you can see here an illustration. So this is actually the tip of a syringe that, uh, that contains this liquid metal. And then you have so this sort of um, microscope that gives you an image of your liquid metal as you manipulate it. It, it takes some practice to, to get a, a neat code like this, but you, you make a blob like this, you make it uh, associate with the substrates, and then you shape, you sort of uh, you play with this uh, interface and you try to separate the blob from the tip, and you hope that you have a, a fairly pointy shape like this that you can then use as a, a top contact in an STM kind of conductive probe approach. But another thing that you can do is you can use microfluidic channels and say PDMS and immobilize this liquid metal in those microfluidic channels and make them land onto your self-assembled monolayer, and then you can obtain very stable devices. Uh, they contain a liquid, so if you want to measure them at say low temperature, that, that can um, break some challenges. But you, there's many things that you can do with that, and it's a very uh, stable system. 
So this liquid metal actually has a native oxide of about 0.166 nanometers, 0.7, something like this. Uh, that protects the uh, the compound and your uh, structure from alloying with this liquid metal, uh, and it also provides uh, a very reliable um, tunneling barrier between your metal and your junction. So you have um, you're in a weak coupling regime where you you can see uh, functional effects on your molecule and really probe uh, that transport. There have been other approaches to, with the self assembly of. Uh, gold lemon particles. So this was a very recent Nature paper, I think from IBM uh, to Rick, actually, um, where they, they attached a, a, a film of uh, gold lemon particles on top of a self-assembled monolayer, and then it evaporated from top contact, and they, they got also an extremely high yield. Um, but the fact that this got published in Nature tells you how much of a challenge it was for so long to contact those structures in an uh, efficient way. But since we've had those um, improvements, it means that we've been able to uh, diversify the chemical structures and really probe the properties and probe them in ways that are not just uh, highly characteristic, but also subject them to other stimuli. So we've been able, so the groups have looked at those uh, molecules uh, for optoelectronic applications for thermoelectrics by eating one of the electrodes more than the other and seeing if that led to. Uh, some potential difference, spintronics, and what I will mostly talk about, memory and logic. Uh, and typically, you can uh, look at different molecular structures and tune them to optimize them for the, up to, for the uh, functional application that you want them to deliver. Uh, so this was done during my PhD to give you an idea of my background, where I made, uh, we made devices uh, by um, attaching uh, semiconductor quantum dots onto self-assembled monolayer uh, out in chains. And what essentially this gives you is a, a very weakly coupled um, molecular junction. Uh, and then we made uh, high, uh, we, we made uh, devices that you could build with parallel processes and so make many devices in parallel, uh, hundreds and hundreds of junctions at a time. Uh, and what we wanted to do was to observe Coulomb blockade and uh, Coulomb blockade we did observe. Uh, in many junctions, and so this was one of the first projects I worked on in my PhD. It was led by a student who was there before me, uh, Joel Freeman, but uh, we, we worked uh, together actively on, on this project, and we managed to find uh, film staircases on, uh, at a very high yield. So to give you an idea, the state of the art at the time for obtaining this kind of transports in devices was about 1%, and we managed to get something close to 50%, and in the projection, in a statistical prog uh, regression of our devices, we found that if we optimize the structure for our smallest junctions, we could get a yield uh, nearing 80%. Uh, so it was really interesting, and that opened avenues for other functional transport that were later on studied by the, the students who came after me. Um, all right, so now I'll move on to the um, logic uh, and memory function. Um, so I will introduce briefly in memory computing. So um, we just had a discussion about AI uh, with each so, uh, the, um, the idea is that in modern computing, you use a lot more resources than you used to, especially for so AI applications or deep learning networks. You need enormous computing resources. And those are, have become a very significant uh, carbon footprint uh, source. And so there's some you will see even in the news that you can have to train a single model. You need more electricity than uh, for a hundred US homes uh, for an entire year. This is a, becoming a, quite an issue with uh, also data centers all around the world, uh, leading to an enormous amount of emission as they are enormous and require very intense uh, air conditioning for those computers to work. So one of the avenues uh, to um, addressing those, uh, uh, those issues is to rethink the way computer uh, computing works. And so in a conventional system, you will have a control unit, a logic unit, and memory storage. And you will have transfer between those two units back and forth um, during your, your processing, uh, your computing. Uh, and the problem is that this transfer is actually the most energy inefficient uh, process in the entire thing. So multiplications, additions, all of the logic um, processes are not that energy uh, consuming. But the transfer between them is several orders of magnitude uh, more uh, energy inefficient and require a lot more and, and wasteful. 
Uh, but what has been proposed in recent years is in-memory computing, where you would have you would rethink the memory um, in a way where the um, computing would happen in the memory itself. So you would bring into the hardware some smart components that where the memory was stored not only uh, the information, but how important it is, and be able to manipulate it directly within the memory hardware. Uh, and so that would allow for parallel local data processing, short memory access latency, very low energy, programmable. And essentially one of the ways you can think about it is that you would bring a deep learning software into the hardware directly, and you wouldn't need to go back and forth uh, between software and hardware to do the intense processing. And a lot of company, a lot of research groups have looked into this, but it's also started to integrate commercial devices with Intel and a lot of other companies starting to have at least some elements of this uh, new paradigm in their commercial uh, products. So the way it's um, the sort of most simple structure that has been uh, studied for this kind of um, technology is that of a crossbar array, uh, where the analogy with the deep learning network is uh, is made quite obvious. So if here, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, deep learning, I'm sure if you will be, uh, but you would have some input layer with lots of inputs that will go into weights. So that will be in your software, where the, the, the software will recognize the importance of the inputs, be trained to treat the information by giving, giving them weights, and it will go into several layers until you get to an output layer that will have treated your inputs and given you uh, the um, output from your train network. Um, in the hardware, so in neuromorphic computing, what you would have is also inputs in the form of voltages that will go into junctions that are um, modulable uh, junctions that can also be trained, where the conductance can be tuned uh, in a way that you, you program uh, in the way that you want. Um, and those will sort of weight the uh, current outputs that you will get. So each of those nodes can be trained independently and have a different conductance. And so then the output that you get for each of those nodes is going to be a sum, so some sort of dot product of all of the conductances of the nodes involved. And so you find yourself with uh, something that replicates the sort of the algorithmic uh, deep learning um, network in the in the hardware. Can I ask you a uh, quick question? Go through. With respect to the energy efficiency of this kind of in-memory computing, are we talking factors of two, ten, or hundred? So if you suppress the um, if you suppress the uh, the transfer, the transit, uh, as it's called, between the uh, logic and the memory, uh, you remove uh, a part of the process that is two order two to three orders of magnitude more wasteful than if you don't have that transfer then obviously it will depend, in practice it will depend on a lot of metrics and how efficient your uh, chip is going to be. But it, just suppressing that transfer between those two units is going to cut down an enormous amount of uh, the energy wasted in the computing. Um, okay, so those uh, modulable nodes uh, that I was describing that you can, of which you can tune the conductance, I also worked on them during my PhD. Um, those are the, the, the candidates for those uh, are what are uh, called memrises. Uh, and the first um, examples of memrises were typically uh, soli uh, solid electrolytes, uh, typically metal oxides, squeezed sandwiched in between two electrodes. And the way that they work at, um, in, in a physical level is that by applying a, a voltage across an oxide, you can pull some ion uh, migration within it. So whether you inject ions uh, extrinsically so into your oxide or you make the oxygen from your oxide migrate, you can then create filaments of uh, oxygen vacancies or of metals that make your um, junction suddenly conductive uh, while it was initially an insulator. And by reversing the voltage, you can um, re-oxidize the filament. Uh, and so if you Depending on the system, you can either have a multi-state system, but depending on the size of the filament, you have different uh, conductance states, so you can have an on-off switch. But this is the kind of technology that um, has been suggested for uh, this new paradigm of computing. Uh, and so at the time, we uh, built uh, also um, junctions with uh, parallel processes 
uh, an interesting thing we found that we could um, uh, cause the migration of oxygen atoms into bubbles like this uh, in a way that also that caused morphological changes where we could see bubbles physically on the microscope uh, that matched also changes in the conductance between uh, high and low conductance states uh, with extremely high um, on-off ratios uh, of up to 10 orders of magnitude. Uh, in molecular junctions, obviously, you do not have an oxide and you do not really have room for filament formations. Um, but there are um, there are uh, molecules that uh, in the field of chemistry are, are typically called molecular switches, which means that they can exist in two stable states depending on what their electrostatic environment is. Uh, and so these can be used in molecular electronic junctions and will respond to a change in voltage by changing the conductance um, approach. So you can see here some um, schematic of energy diagrams of a potential uh, molecular switch, where depending on the voltage applied, you can find yourself with more uh, larger or smaller band gaps uh, or homoluma gaps that are going to uh, lead to different uh, conductance states. So here, for example, you can have, um, uh, this would be for, um, an analog memory where you have many different conducting states. And here, this would be a more uh, on-off two-state system uh, with very high on-off ratios. Um, so I'm going to go to the first project I'm going to introduce with a methyl biologin, which is uh, this compound here. Um, so it was already known in, uh, in chemistry and in the liquid states that this, uh, depending on its electrostatic um, environment, could uh, dimerize where you would have individual molecules looking like this. If you um, if you change the pH in your solution, and this was verified by uh, CD, so cyclic voltammetry, uh, you could cause them to create compounds where they would stack together uh, in dimers uh, in, a, in a very stable way. And so the idea behind the, the project was to use those compounds in molecular junctions and see if we could see the switching uh, in, um, in an electronic junction. So what we did is we um, create we so the Paul Kibis, uh, the, the sort of chemist in the group synthesized this compound where it, it would be attached to an alkene chain. So you, we would also uh, make it an asymmetric junction, uh, and this helps also with the formation of a sample because you slightly more stable uh, films. And one thing that's interesting is that those compounds. So this is the MEV, the methyl biogen are not stable uh, by themselves, they're not charge neutral. So what happens is that they retain counter ions from your self-assembly process. Uh, so here they're noted as X minus, and that is because we can actually choose uh, which counter ion we want. Uh, we just have to immerse them in, a, in, a, in an environment that is going to be rich of a particular ion, and they're going to pick them up and be decorated for them. So we did it with iodine, chlorine, bromine, etc. Uh, many different compounds, and I'll come to why this was interesting in a minute. So then when we use our liquid metal methods to characterize uh, our junctions, um, what we found is um, clearly some switching. So uh, a two-state uh, um, IV um, profile. So if I scan my voltage from zero to one, I see something like this. And then if I go into the negative, I start seeing an increase here, which we call step one and then a sudden jump. And what we find is a jump in current of about four orders of magnitude, 6.7 uh, times 10 to the three. Uh, and it is reversible, and we can go back and forth like this for uh, hundreds of cycles and retain those quantities. Um, an interesting thing as well is that the high conductance state is only in the negative polarity, meaning that we have some dual functionality of both the switch uh, that can be turned on and off, but also the rectifier, where the on state is only accessible in one polarity, uh, which you could call a, which is typically called a 1D1R, one so one diode, one resistor, and that can be really interesting for applications that I'll come to in a minute. But first, I'm going to talk about the switching mechanism. So this was not, uh, this was quite difficult to characterize, and that was done mostly by the more, um, chemically trained people in the group as well, uh, and uh, some um, collaborators in theory from the University of Central Florida in particular, uh, and some 
also many measurements changing the scan to right and seeing if that, that had an impact. And what we could see is that it did in fact have an impact and you, you would find different activation energies. So the switching would occur at different voltages, depending on the size of your counter ion. And it matched the sort of uh, it matched the it, it matched the trends that you would expect given the size of the counter ion compounds that would require more energy to be equals to um, to migrate within your junction. And so the way we understand it, and we even have some XPS signatures of it, is that after you apply your negative voltage, uh, sufficiently um, low voltage, you would cause the migration of those counter ions onto the surface of your bottom electrode, meaning that um, well, changing the electrostatic environment at the sites of your methyl biologens. And we would that would cause them to dimer uh, to dimerize the same way that has been measured before in solution. We could find in um, uh, in cyclic photometry that we find them in our electronic junctions as well. So those would form uh, dimer compounds that are going to have very different uh, conductance um, properties. And so you find it here. Um, the process can be an electronic sample. I I migration leading to dimerization of MEB. So we've applied the voltage. This counter ion uh, shoots to the bottom electrode. You have a dimerization. The way this was modeled by our theory collaborators was you have this fairly large fan cap. But as you um, as you increase the voltage, the counter ion crossing there changes completely the home and lumen gap uh, in the dimer system. And then those can both enter the conduction band and contribute to um, um, to high conductance uh, transport. Quick, quick. Uh, so what are the time scales of this ion migration? So that's that's a good question. Actually, uh, I've got a few slides about this, and the next few slides are exactly about this. What's the what's migration mechanism? What's the migration mechanism? Like how what? <laughs> what how, how did they move? Because well, you, you're exerting an electrostatic force through the voltage, uh, and they are free to migrate within the junction. This is how it's been. We, we characterize it in liquid form. And somehow we find it also in the solid state matching the... Right, but there's no liquid between your pile layers there. So how does that, how does actually the ion pop from... So it, it lands on sites on the, on the silver. It's a really interesting question. I understand that, but, but you have like a nanometer, you have C12 there now. That's a long distance. That's right. So how does that, how does, and, and if it's... If it's as the cartoon shows, which mm -hmm. correct, that sounds good. If it's a dense self assembled alkane pile layer, how is Nile going to move through it? It's a, it's a good question. And um, actually, I don't really know but if calling it, um, it's, a, it's not in liquid environment, but also it's not in dry vacuum. And my intuition would be that it, it does travel through. Possibly moisture, possibly some uh, remnants of uh, solvent. It, I, I cannot. Like, it's uh, the other part that I know. I can't imagine this whole sheet coming down like this because it repels each other. So you know, if one of the ions is a little bit ahead of the other, this can't be pushed back up. You no, know? despite the electric field you're applying, electric field you're applying is ten to nine volts per meter or something. Since that, um, yeah, one, it's not one volt. No. One volt is approximately one nanometer. Whereas you know the the the, the other ion there, probably mm -hmm. over there is ten times closer. Now. So it's electric, it's local electric field is much higher. Mm -hmm. uh, so magically, somehow it pierces the bottom. This is what we. Does it does it break the bond? I was in in XPS, but I I was not. Uh, does it break the thiol bond? I don't think it breaks the thiol bond because we can if we have something stable that we can then reverse by uh, applying a positive voltage afterwards. The thiol bond is not very strong, no? It is not very strong, but we, we see it. It withstands typically voltages of, uh, at least in this system, we can apply 1.5 volts typically and have it still stable uh, for very simple alkyl thiol that, that don't have a sort of functional group. This is the kind of uh, voltages that we can get to, uh, 1.5 to 2 volts. Yeah, but this is um there's some I okay, I can uh, lead you to the paper as well, but you're going to have a whole discussion by the you also have some molecular dynamics 
uh, simulations from the University of Limerick, Damien Thompson. Um, it's a good question. This is not really, uh, I, I cannot give you the details of, um, of this, unfortunately. All right, so we did some further calculation about the stability and the tax scales of uh, the junction. So we use some simple AC uh, voltage modulations to measure the cutoff frequency that is dictated a bit more by the capacitance of the system than the uh, uh, rapidity of the migration. Um, but we find uh, a, a cutoff voltage in terms of a capacitance at 100 hertz, which doesn't make it very fast, but um, then uh, it allowed us to do some endurance tests where we could see whether the um, rectification of the, the junction survives uh, many cycles and we could apply about more than one million cycles uh, and maintain a fairly stable uh, rectification ratio between the two polarities. Then the switching speed measurements. So this is these are this this will address your, your questions about migration speed. So in order to gauge this, we did some sort of we, we did some square wave uh, square wave measurements. So we apply voltage forces and measure the current as a measure the current increase as a function of the applied voltage. Uh, this does not give you exactly uh, the switching speed, but it gives it will give you some idea of the um, of the uh, order of magnitude that you can obtain depending on the applied voltage. And so what we find is that we have the switching speeds that depends on your on your applied voltage, as you might expect, where for applied voltages of about uh, one volt, uh, we have um, characteristic times uh, of the order of uh, so what I call characteristic times is this kind of arbitrary cutoff where I've had 63.2 percent of um, my maximum current within my voltage volts uh, reached. So essentially, doing a, a, an exponential fit onto my uh, onto my increase in current um, and taking the sixty three point two percent as the uh, characteristic uh, time. And so, at one volt, we get something of the order of uh, two milliseconds. And as we increase towards one point six volts, uh, we get to sub millisecond regimes in terms of this characteristic time. Whether we reach the actual maximum current within that pulse is uh, not something that we, we know, but the fact that we see a neat dependence means that we are surely in that uh, territory. So, sorry, mm -hmm. what is what exactly? So, that is the current normalized as a function of its maximum during the voltage pulse. So, we have a voltage pulse that is here, for example. I measure the current, and then I say, I measure essentially the, the, how steep this increases as a function of the applied voltage. So what that curve shows is that it's not an exponential decay, correct? Well, if I take the, the value at 63.2%, uh, I can fit it with an exponential and that... But if it's a uh, one given number, let's say whatever your one volt, since it's not a straight line... Sorry. Yeah, it could be, I could have taken another... So, so okay, what, what, I guess that's how you define your characteristic time, but essentially because it's not a straight line, that's why you can't extract the characteristic time. That's why you have. Yeah, to... it is not an exact reading of. Because I am going to move dispersively, they don't actually have exponential. No, time. I just wanted to have some consistent measure of how fast the, the process is. Well, it's, it's not extreme, it's not scientifically extremely thorough, yeah. but I wanted to have some scale of how fast uh, the process uh, the process is. Well. Okay, so I mentioned it before, 1G, 1 hours of weight is interesting. So if you remember the crossbar rates that I described earlier, uh, one thing that is um, very important in that is that you want to prevent sneak back currents, which is where you would have currents going into your crossbar, but then not taking the direct path into your desired output, but going uh, into several, taking a detour into the other nodes uh, and then reaching your outputs, giving you some parasitic um, computation, I might call it, some uh, um, contributions from inputs that are not supposed to be relevant to the way you programmed your, your crossbar. So typically, the way this is done in solid state systems is that you would essentially have to have two components, uh, one selector and one uh, memory stuff. And so that adds an extra layer uh, in, your, in your load. And typically, that also means that you need to apply higher voltages, and that also makes um, 
takes up space. So you, you, you will need slightly thicker components. So what's interesting in our case is that it's all done within the, the molecule itself. So we do not require an extra layer because it provides both functionalities at the same time. And we have very small set voltages, so we can activate our molecules with voltages around one volt, as you've seen. Uh, whereas in even the state of the art solutions, if you have two components, two layers, that pushes your switch, your switching voltage to uh, voltages above uh, two to three volts. The next project I'm going to talk about is uh, has to do with uh, neuromorphic electronics. Uh, so neuromorphic electronics is the idea of developing logic systems that are going to be inspired by an animal neural system. So the central element of that is uh, the synapse, which is the junction that uh, is going to transfer the uh, neural um, signals throughout your entire neural system. So they have lots of uh, very inspiring properties that uh, have uh, that, that uh, researchers in the field have tried to replicate. One interesting thing is that it is uh, multi-state in the sense that your synapse uh, will change its efficiency as a function of how much you utilize it. So if your if if your synapse uh, is in a is at a function in your neural system that is uh, triggered regularly uh, because it is important to your functioning. Um, it's going to get more and more efficient at transporting uh, the current and well, transporting the signal. Um, and so this this can be linked to multi-state memory in the context of uh, computing. It is uh, reversible, so you can detrain uh, a synaptic uh, junction. Um, and it has potentiation plasticity. So it's been found that the not only the frequency of that signal is going to change the way your uh, synapse is going to operate, but also all of the parameters of the spikes uh, that it receives, uh, whether it be their amplitude, um, the delay between them, um, I mentioned frequency, the duration, and potentially the, the shape of the, the spike that it receives. Um, and so these are the properties uh, typically referred to as uh, potentiation plasticity that uh, people have tried to replicate in electronic components. And so that leads me to my second uh, molecular compound, uh, which is uh, HATNA, so this piece, um, which is also a molecular switch, except that whereas the previous one had two distinct stable um, states, this one has a lot more accessible states if you allow protonation to happen. So it changes with the environment of hydrogen atoms. So you can you have seven protonation states available to, to you with that compound as each of the, the arms of this compound can be decorated with um, an electroproton. And so this is the CV in, um, uh, in, in a liquid cell of all of these uh, reduction processes. So similarly, we attach them onto uh, <coughs> bottom electrodes uh, and onto alkene chains um, to uh, Correct those junctions that we then probed with the uh, um, E gain method, so the liquid metal method. And then when we measure them uh, electrically, we find a, a really interesting um, IED profile uh, where we get repeatable NDR, so negative differential resistance, um, whereby we have a, first a current enhancement, a conductance enhancement as we scan, and then uh, we reach a peak. And then we go back down, and then the peak to value ratio that we see typically is of 20. Um, we also see the rectification between the two polarities, with uh, high conductance states being obtained in the negative polarity and hardly any switching in the, in the positive polarity. Um, and so, then by changing the scanning rate of um, this uh, IAD characterization, we find that we, we can tune the shape of this NDR uh, which made us believe that there was potentially some uh, room for some plasticity and some interesting um, characterization to be done. So the way we understood the transport mechanism uh, with our um, collaborators in theory, we tried to model uh, all of the potato and protonation states uh, separately is that if you start from uh, having zero protonation in your uh, base compound, 
uh, you have this sort of, you have this uh, band gap here, so this homo gap. But as you change the epistatic environment and it starts to reach the other um, the other resonating states, you have interband levels that become available to you in your conduction window for transport. But as you go towards the last resonating states and you've fully protonated your compound, the um, interstate levels uh, disappear and you end up with an insulating compound again. Um, and so the way we understood it is that the, um, the protonation happens with the, from exchanges with the environment. Uh, so we had to do this measurements in, um, in a humid environment. A uh, humid environment, it was just Singapore weather. Um, <laughs> But we did uh, some measurements also in uh, humidity free and dry uh, environments and found that we didn't see any switching or change of state. So we had a very strong dependence of the transport properties on uh, the humidity event of the environment and the composition of the environment. So this is something that required uh, exchanges with the, um, the ambient um, water molecules. And so we would, um, it would exchange as we would apply the voltage and change the sort of electrostatic environment, it would exchange those uh, water molecules. Um, the the, the half molecule would exchange protons with their water molecules and change its uh, chemical state. So then what I focused on was to characterize them as potential uh, artificial synapses. So the electronic components are going to replicate the synapses that I mentioned before. Um, in, uh, in electric form. So a typical way of assessing the potential of artificial synapses uh, in electronics is to subject them to pulse sequences and see how they are affected by those pulses and all of this, the parameters of, their, of, um, of those pulses. So here, for example, um, this is a typical pulse sequence that, I would, uh, that I, would, I would subject my junction to. I would send a pair of pulses of two voltage pulses um, and then measure the difference in conductance between the first one and the second one. And then I would repeat this measurement for each time varying one of the parameters of those pulses. So it could be the voltage amplitude of that pulse, or it could be the duration of that pulse, or it could be the delay between the two pulses. And then I would see if I find some, um, uh, some dependence uh, of this uh, difference in conductance um, on those parameters. And th this would tell me whether I have uh, what is called neuromorphic plasticity. And so whether I get this extra level of control over how I've trained my, um, uh, my electronic switch. So as an example here, uh, I applied these, uh, these junctions varying the amplitudes of the uh, voltage pulse every time uh, and measured so this um, change in conductance and found that depending on the amplitude of my voltage pulse, I could go from an excitatory re uh, regime where the second pulse would actually become uh, more conductive than the first one to an inhibitory regime um, where I would reduce the conductance of my junction by applying a slightly higher amplitude pulse. So that gives me an extra level of control if I want to tune uh, the conductance states of my molecule. Uh, we do not have physical function to describe the trend, but this you have you can see a clear um, a, a clear kind of a kind of trend uh, going downwards as you uh, increase the amplitude of your pulse. And I did similar measurements varying the other parameters. So I changed also the pulse duration uh, and I could see that the um, uh, difference in conductance also had uh, a very clear trend where the longer my pulse, uh, the more I would uh, reduce my uh, conductance, but in a way that did not follow a linear route, something that we uh, fitted with an exponential function, but that is essentially some form of decay that could probably be fitted with other kinds of uh, functions. We changed the pulse delay in between molecules, uh, in between pulses, excuse me, uh, and also found uh, some um, uh, some dependence. Uh, you can see here in red that we had our uh, theoretical <laughs> um, theorist elaborators uh, trying to have a go at, uh, at predicting the, the, this uh, conductance, fitting this uh, conductance modulation, and did a pretty good job at that. Uh, 
That's the work I close to what I was measuring in my lab. Um, and then a reset process where I could also have a process that would reset my junction and bring it back to the initial neutral state that I was uh, that I started off from. And so we have uh, we define plasticity uh, as a function of pulse amplitude, pulse duration, and pulse delay. Uh, there was another one that we wanted to see, which was um, as a function of pull of spike rate of pulse rate. Uh, so here, for example, you can see my junction where I apply, I apply voltage pulses at uh, different rates. Um, so those are arguably quite slow, but I can change between uh, 46 millihertz to uh, 250 millihertz. And what you can see is if you look at the current uh, at a low uh, pulse rate, I have an increase in that current, a steady increase. And as I increase the pulse rate, then I go back down and I can do cycles like this and repeat them. One thing that you can see that's interesting is that I do not really have, so here it looks almost linear, but if you look closely, you do. I don't really see a linear increase or a linear decrease. You see some sort of curvature. This is typically called um, habituation in the field. Uh, and essentially, that's you, kind of, uh, that's you running out of uh, chemical reactions to cause. Uh, but it's also similar to processes that are uh, biological that would uh, prevent overdriving your system. You wouldn't want your synapse to be. Um, too triggered, so in overdrive, uh, so you also have run out of the, um, you, you kind of saturate the the, um, the reactions in, in your junctions. Um, and then one thing that is uh, also quite encouraging is that as we went through cycles like this, uh, we could kind or almost retrieve uh, conduction states, uh, not exactly, but very close. Uh, and so that gave us hope that with uh, further optimization, you could map uh, several a multi-state uh, process, and you could encode uh, those conductance states and retrieve them and encode information into them. Uh, this was again the fitting and the, from the models of um, our collaborator from University of Central Florida, where they've mapped the uh, state parameters of the levels meant to um, regulate the conductance states, and we could see uh, some sort of very replicable uh, behavior, and that matched our measures. Uh, pulses fairly well. Uh, so if you compare the blue and the red, they are on top of each other. And other things that we wanted to do is to uh, do fun things with the, this uh, highly modulable, um, these are highly modulable junctions. So one of the, what we wanted to do is try a, a very simple artificial neural network. So what we tried to do is to replicate Pavlov's um, experiments in uh, electro uh, electro uh, electrical form. So if uh, I use my analogy of the path of dog experiments, you, most of you will probably know what, uh, what the experiment is, but uh, a dog, when being shown food, is going to salivate because it's going to associate it with a, a dinner time approaching. But if, um, and if you make it hear a bell, it will not associate it with um, any foods and so will uh, not read, uh, readily uh, salivate or be ready for dinner. Um, but if you do both actions at the same time and present the foods as you uh, ring a bell, eventually the dog will associate uh, those, two, um, those two conditions and then be sensitive any time it hears a bell because it will know that it's going to be shown foods uh, at the same time. So what we did here is we had two uh, what we would call neurons, but that were really voltage sources. Uh, one of them, uh, and two, two voltage sources going into uh, an ammeter, which is going to be our, uh, our up output, uh, where we're going to see uh, a signal in current or not. Uh, neuron one is meant to um, symbolize a uh, dot C through. So it's connected to that output uh, neuron through uh, a stable resistor, a low resistance resistor because it is the signal will go directly uh, from the input to the output with a positive response. So if I send uh, voltage pulses from my neuron one into my output, uh, I see uh, a modulation in current in the milliamp regime. So if you look in red here, uh, I'm in uh, at minus one milliamp, and I have these pulses uh, coming directly from neuron one. If I then send pulses from neuron two, which is meant to um, represents dot here as well, and that goes through our switch, our molecular switch, that first is not trained, um, I'm going to see some uh, parasitic noise, just capacitance 
uh, nice, but no substantial occurrence. You should know that we're in the micro-amp regime and we do not see detect anything, <laughs> anything in the output if we just send voltage pulses through uh, from uh, neuron two through our switch. But then if we send pulses from the two sources at the same time, um, this is going to change the state in uh, my um, in my switch and make it sensitive to a signal and turn it sort of activated and so condition it into being uh, transporting um, transporting signals. And then after I've done this training by uh, shooting both signals together, after I send pulses through uh, from neuron two, then I have a, a discernible, I have a measurable response from my output when I only uh, send a signal from neuron two without involving neuron one. So this is a simple sort of proof of concept of interesting sort of conditional training that you can do with those uh, modulable switches. Um, and that was a, a fun experiment to, to, to set up. Another thing you can do, and I think that's um, that's really a good illustration of what plasticity is used for. Uh, so if you think about our junction as a two-terminal device, um, and typically logic you would associate probably with transistors where you would require an input and a condition on this input, so a source strain uh, voltage, but also um, a gate voltage that's going to um, to decide whether you're going to have a high or low conductance state, whether your switch is on or off. Uh, but here we only have two terminals, but we have something, thanks to the plasticity, we know that depending on the parameters of your signal, you can obtain very different results. So what we wanted to do is have this system where we would consider that um, increasing the conductance state of your junction would be a positive output. I'm sorry, but okay. <laughs> so if you have an increase in the conductance in your second pulse after this middle pulse, this would be an output of one. And if you had a decrease, it would be an output of zero. But then uh, we would separate um, the signal that we sent, so this training pulse, as two separate inputs, where I would get a choice of what the amplitude would be and what the duration would be. And if I choose the right parameters for uh, these, I can define zero and one inputs, uh, input states. And what we managed to do then is to demonstrate um, all of the volume logic gates. So if I've, uh, I've chosen parameters for my zero and one states in terms of uh, amplitude input, uh, and I've done the same with the duration of that training course, and I could replicate in the outputs, this would be the AND logic gates. Uh, similarly, by choosing uh, slightly different input parameters, uh, defining the input uh, parameters of uh, 1 and 0 uh, with slightly different uh, physical quantities, then I obtain uh, my all gates, my all logic gates. And we replicated this with all of the other gates, so XOR and all and 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 NXOR. Um, interestingly, for NXOR, it was quite tricky because my training balls I had to design it as two consecutive pulses, uh, making it a bit more difficult. But we, we got there eventually, and we could find an output of uh, 1001. Uh, we were quite happy about that. So I'll uh, go through a quick summary of those two projects on memory and logic in the those molecular junctions. So we've seen two types of molecular junctions uh, with hybrid functionality. So first, the 1D1R uh, with high on operation. Um, so with two very different conductor states and a low set voltage because of the encoding of both functionalities within the same electron there. Uh, and then a multi-state switch with large NDR reproducible and multi-parameter plasticity uh, that I've then demonstrated could be uh, was an artificial synapse. And that was the first demonstrated um, artificial synapse from a molecular junction. Um, the only one I'm uh, promising was suppressing sleep back currents and crossbar arrays. We managed to integrate it into uh, valuable devices, which is another challenge. Uh, the dynamic switch can be used in an artificial synapse uh, if we exploit the plasticity without all of the spike parameters. Uh, and then quickly, this is a, a project, a small project that I did with uh, A Star, the institute that we talked about earlier, uh, where we wanted to see if we could. Um, Use uh, combine the, the liquid metal method with some uh, AFM manipulation uh, and possibly uh, probe our structures um, in a way that would make it optically also accessible. So 
If we mix our liquid metal with uh, ethanol and sonicate it, we obtain a colloid. And then we drop, we drop cast that, uh, that colloid onto the target substrates. And so we found our self-assembled monodiode. So we use simple molecules as a proof of concept to simple alkane chains of different uh, lengths. And we decorated them with those droplets of, um, of liquid metal. And so what we find, so here we have a lovely um, SEM image. So this is actually the cantilever of an AFM decorated by those uh, droplets of just a few microns. So you can see here, uh, two microns, the um, scale bar here. So those would be typically four microns in, in diameter. And we could see some, um, and we could image them through a transparent substrate as well. And so what we do is we pick them up with a cancer either, and then we can transport those droplets and then put them in various places on our cones and uh, change the voltage uh, and measure their, their current response. Um, well, so as a proof of concept, to be sure that we were measuring the current through our self-assembled monolayers, we measured the current as a function of the length of the alkene chain um, from uh, four carbon atoms to 10. Uh, and we found uh, the kind of length dependence that you would expect uh, for those alkene chains. Uh, we find actually an attenuation uh, coefficient that completely matches uh, what has been extensively measured with the normal liquid metal methods with the conductive pit. One thing that is that surprised us, and that we're still not entirely sure we understand very well, was that those junctions were extremely stable and that we could apply voltages of 5 volts across them. Um, and so uh, when typically you would have a, uh, a breakdown of your junction at 8 megavolts per centimeter, uh, here this survives uh, 50 megavolts per centimeter. Um, so we did do some tests by bursting uh, those um, bursting those uh, droplets to see if whether whether there was a significant uh, voltage drop at that side of the junction. But found that um, that was not the case, and that most of the the the, that's the very large majority of the voltage was dropped uh, across the molecular structure. So we're not quite sure how it happens that we, we have such a stable junction with the, the droplets surviving and that kind of a voltage is what we do. So this could be potentially interesting for uh, measuring more um, fragile contents in the future if this has yet to be tried on other, on other species. And so this concludes uh, my seminar on molecular electronics. Uh, there's a few people I want to thank. So these are the relevant papers that I mentioned today, with the first two being from my Cambridge years, and the other three being the projects that I've done uh, that I did in, uh, at AUS. And we have a few collaborators. So uh, the leader of those projects were, well, the PI behind those projects was Christian uh, uh, Neuhaus, who's now at the University of Clinton. Um, but we, um, uh, benefited a lot for, from collaboration for these are our theory collaborators. So we had molecular um, dynamic simulations from Limerick from Ben and Tuxton. And so uh, that was also collaboration with ASTAR and the University of Oxford. And so, yes, that's, uh, that's it from me. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. Uh, questions? Yes. Uh, uh... Now you question with those uh, elimination of those logic gates consequence was it kind of treated by hand or was there some decision? So it, 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 it came after a lot of private tweaking by myself. Uh, so I I was quite I was fairly familiar with the system to know the time scales on which it operated, uh, and it was uh, it was surprisingly stable to this uh, molecule. It, it, it seems that it's a very messy system in terms of IV dynamics, but whenever I made a new junction, I would measure almost exactly the same thing, the same time scale. And even when it would uh, decay, it would decay in exactly the same way. So I knew how to operate it. And so then I knew what kind of parameters uh, to use to obtain um, all of the different gates. I don't know if that does answer your, your question. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating, really neat stuff. It's going to come straight in the last part with the neuromorphic mm -hmm. computing and the attempt at serving artificial synapse. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'm going to 
I'm going to put to you what I heard, maybe in a different language than you use, if that's okay. So a chemist might call what you're doing kinetically controlling. Uh, so, so you've got these, you've got this molecule that exhibits seven protonation states, depending on mm -hmm. what you say, right. right? So what what mixes that soup? Yeah. So you know, you know, principles of equilibrium might give you uh, a set of concentrations which you modify because you're actually doing dynamics or you're mm -hmm. applying pulse sequences. So those pulse sequences actually control the population of each one of those protonation states, which would be sort of kinetically controlling the, mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. And then and then you've got these sort of Either end of those protonation states, you have like molecules that have P3H symmetry, and everything in between, you have a low symmetry state. That's right. And that's and that puts an electronic state right in the middle of the nice yeah. yeah. mm -hmm. So how much of like this is totally new for me? Mm -hmm. How much of that is novel? And I, and how you know I'm like because it seems very novel to me. I've never heard of anything like that before. Well, it or is, is this an active thing? Um, so I have to be careful. So there have been uh, electronic switches based on molecules. Uh, one of the pioneers in this field is actually uh, from Edmonton, uh, Matt Creary, if you're familiar with, them, with it. Uh, but those would tended to be two state switches. Uh, so such as the first one that I showed, uh, where you would have two stable states. And for some reason, that gives you they tend to behave if you have a, a structure that's fairly stable, they tend to sort of not behave in unison, but react at a similar sort of voltage range. And so you find yourself in this kind of two-state solution. I've seen lots of work like that. Yeah. Is but in this case, something so the way you describe this in the paper is a dynamic molecular switch, because it's out of equilibrium, as you were saying. We kind of explore a sort of dimension uh, between all of those accessible states. Uh, that react fairly slowly, and that sort of they're never sort of in a stable environment. Um, they're never really stable in their state, um, and so those measurements on neuromorphic, so uh, artificial synapse measurements, have never been done on molecular junctions before. There would be other candidates potentially, but I'm not familiar with other projects that would give you a multi-state system like this, where you would be able to go up and down this sort of ladder of, uh, of density of states. Then, of course, if you look at chemistry papers, so if you look at those compounds, the, those, the, the papers that we were inspired by uh, to build these molecules, they came from pure chemistry research, but that, that was in uh, liquid states. And so those have been explored before, those, uh, those compounds that would have all of those states accessible depending on the pH. Um, but in terms of medical electronics, uh, I've not really seen it in the, in the rest of the literature. But logic and memory function in those molecules is something that uh, is getting some traction. So you have a group also in uh, in Bonnier, in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, where they, they, they're also looking at that kind of applications in molecular junctions. Uh, but I'm not aware of multi-state memory like this. So I, I may be wrong, but as far as I know, this was well, the first one. It's, it's, not, it's not a whole field that I've never heard about. It's, okay. it really Thank you. So, so I have a question concerning that mo the model that you're not there with alkane thiol and the big seven state molecule on top. Mm -hmm. um, that structure is probably not where that cartoon is nowhere close to experimental reality. Do you see if that with dependence on the chain? Because mm -hmm. some cell is driven by chain chain. Yeah. yeah. You have this big head group. Typically, these things look really messy. Mm -hmm. How does that affect, you know? So, is that maybe the answer where the ions go? Because if it doesn't have to travel, yeah, it, it, we, we expect the, the, the reality to be a lot messier than our schematics. Uh, it, it's a really good question, your ion migration question, and I wish I had a better answer for it. Uh, but... The reason I'm also asking is because you know, your symmetry breaking. Department just alluded to yeah. that is inspired by believing that this cartoon has anything to do with reality. Well, the, the molecular states, I believe, right? So that so he has this this you know pretty rigid threefold symmetry in the plane molecule, and he shows a bunch of protonation states, right? Some of them have threefold yeah. symmetry, and the ones in the middle don't. Yeah, I, I kind of had that. Yeah. So, but, but is it 
I agree. The, the cartoon of the sand maybe is something like well, a little, little structure. Where do these eyes? Where do they go? Where? You don't actually have to go yeah. that far. Yeah. But at the molecular level, I think that's a good model. I mean, and especially in the chemistry literature, this. Yeah, but a lot of the characterization is done fast in liquids. But which, you know, 20 years ago, when people did rotax hands, yeah. that was really the part that screwed them up because electrochemistry was not the same like mm -hmm. electrodes. Oh, yeah. That platinum top electrode. Yeah. The gold top electrode, it was essentially electrochemistry at the interface that was happening, mm -hmm. no matter what you actually put in as a junction. Think, so, yeah. sure. you know, to some extent, I think that's maybe the reason why it's, this is essentially renewable field because yeah. Schoen and all the Rotexan things that mm -hmm. HP was pushing kind of didn't work out. And so they must have not for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I think this is an interesting reliable. Regarding your question about the, the backbone to the, yeah. the art in chain. A lot of the research, so that was before I joined that group, um, but they got, so they looked several big moments in, 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 in that group and what it, it sort of bothered mm -hmm. group from uh, Harvard. So the first thing they saw would be this method for contacting those have assembled monodimers. So it allowed them to characterize, to characterize a lot of uh, compounds quite quickly and quite reliably uh, with a large statistical distribution. Right. So, okay. So, I'm more from the same molecule side, so the uh -huh. fact that you can reliably contact them, yeah. it's great, but it doesn't mean that you're actually measuring the average of molecules, you might actually be measuring defects on it. Well, so the thing is, there are certain things that you can tweak to sort of make sure that you get transport that at least depends highly on the, the structure. And that's why nobody shows the prefactor, they all show, you all show the length dependence, the prefactor virus world, you're, you're, you're yeah, so the prefactor on, on, on okay. a long scale. So, yeah. Or the magnitude variability to respond thing. It's yeah, so the, the fact that you um, so that there's a so before I joined that group, there was a lot of uh, the other big moments uh, was when they discovered this very high rectification ratio in ferrocenes that were attached to back home. And they did a lot of work characterizing the transport properties as a function of the length of that backbone. Or where the ferrocene was placed within that backbone, okay. including in the middle, the yeah. top, the bottom. And they found they could exp it made sense. So they had a, an attenuation which uh, followed the trends that you might expect. Um, I'm, I'm not saying, I mean, what I'm saying, uh, saying is that the fact that you got these trends and the variability is so far the manager is interesting from this is an interesting system. Yeah. There's lots of open questions because in semiconductors, mm -hmm. Thing that makes your your mind over the one part in ten to the six mm -hmm. is considered the, what what you need here getting getting to within two words of magnitude is considered success. So one is mm -hmm. it's really interesting from a technology point of view and from a science point of view to understand mm -hmm. exactly how. Uh, but, but you, you do essentially it was a method that allowed it, it's a method, a method that allows you to have the statistically significant sample, right? But you can just have trends, which is so a great that, it's a great progress because mm -hmm. before that every measurement was everywhere else. Yeah. The, there's actually another paper that was also performed where they tried to measure how much of the junction was contacted, and they did a sort of plasmonic sure. junction, but it would look at uh, emission sensors uh, in those molecules, in those junctions made with the data metal top electrode, and they found that in a very large structure that would be 100 micron in radius, they would find the hundreds mm -hmm. uh, shining spots that would correspond to the junction. So you have a you have a contact efficiency that's extremely low. Um, but well, because we've discussed that, perfect. Thanks very much again for a really interesting and stimulating.